Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Barbara Ham Lee. So here's the deal. African Americans and whites smoke marijuana at similar rates, but black folks are almost four times more likely to be arrested for weed possession than white folks. Why? As the push is on in Virginia to decriminalize cannabis, we ask the question, is this a good thing for the black community? We have a stellar panel with us to discuss marijuana from an African American perspective, from growing to distribution to use to criminal justice. What's the connection between race and pot? Stay tuned. Another View is next. Discussing today's topics from an African-American perspective, this is Another View. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Another View. I'm Barbara Ham Lee. Before we get into our conversation today, just wanted to say um, very um, heartfelt condolences to the Nussbaum family. Robert Nussbaum has passed. Um, he was a dear friend of Another View, very, very supportive of this program. And uh, we are just heartbroken that he is gone. But um, I just want to say to the family that we're thinking of you today. And um, I also want to say that I took the time to go to Ohef Shalom on uh, Monday night to uh, fellowship with and come together over the uh, shootings that happened in Pennsylvania, um, in Pittsburgh last week. And it was such an outpouring of love and support and, and people coming together. And I just wanted to thank those in the congregation. They were very warm to me. Um, but we all stand together in the solidarity to try to bring our country back together and to be able to spend time together. And that's what it's supposed to be all about. So it's an industry that is clearly not going away, recreational and medical marijuana. In 31 states, including Virginia, it is legal to use pot for medical purposes. In nine states and the District of Columbia, recreational use by people over 21 is legal. According to a 2017 Gallup poll, 64% of Americans support legalization of marijuana and legal marijuana sales top $9.7 billion, with a B, dollars in North America last year. Yet when it comes to possession of pot, African Americans are more likely to be arrested and spend time in jail than their white counterparts. And there are few African Americans who are on the economic side of the marijuana industry. So why the disparity? Joining us to talk about marijuana and the black community are Commonwealth's attorney, Greg Underwood. Hi, Greg. How are you? I'm fine. Thank you. Good. Thank My you pleasure for being, being here. here. Thank you. Attorney Wanda Cooper, who specializes in restoration of civil rights and the Expungement. How you doing, Wanda? Well, thank you. Good. Thank you so much for being here. Joe Dillard, president of uh, Norfolk's NAACP. Hey, Joe. Hey, Barbara. <laughs> How are thank you? Thank you for having me. Absolutely. And Bob Stevens with Genesis Cannabis Consulting. How are you, Bob? I'm fine, Barbara. Thank you. Good. So, um, Greg, I'm going to come to you first because sure. I, I need to understand, I want the audience to understand the difference between decriminalizing marijuana and legalizing marijuana. The difference between decriminalizing and legalizing, decriminalizing simply means that uh, if you get stopped for possession of marijuana, they'll treat it like a traffic ticket, more like a civil offense. And legalizing it means that it's legal to possess and to use. Mm -hmm. Now, if it was legalized, it would have some probably statutory restrictions just as alcohol has when it comes to the age in which you can buy it, the age of consumption and things like that. Mm -hmm. I support legalizing marijuana. So you support going going the whole way. Yes. But at this point in Virginia, we don't have either. No, we don't have either. Okay. It's a criminal offense. I'm on the board of directors of the Virginia Association of Commonwealth Attorneys, mm -hmm. VACA. And last December, we voted to take a position in... As a result of the vote, uh, we took no position. It's 120 members. It was about 100 there, 120 Commonwealth attorneys. It was about 100 there. And the majority, well, I would say half the group voted to decriminalize it. The other half voted to leave the law the way it is. Mm -hmm. And I was the single vote for legalization of marijuana. Why do you want to legalize it? I have a problem with the fact that you can be in another state 
and it's not a crime. You mm. can be across the border in D.C. or Maryland. It's not a crime. But once you cross that line, it's a crime. And the other issue I have is the impact that it has on minorities. Clearly in Norfolk, I would say 80 percent of the arrests are black people. That was in 2017, 2016. And uh, there's something wrong with the picture. And then 89 percent of rear arrests are African-Americans. It shouldn't be that way. There's a problem with that. Why do you deal with people who get arrested, who who are looking for um, for legal representation? I mean, I mean, what's the typical person who gets stopped for marijuana possession? What's going on with them? Uh, usually they're stopped for something other than marijuana. They might be speeding, reckless driving. Um, they might be just walking down the street, minding their own business. Mm. Um, and an officer has contact with them. And they might smell the odor of marijuana. Um, there's all different types of marijuana now, Barbara. I used to not believe when an officer said I could smell it from my car to your car. Wow. But now because of all the different types of marijuana, mm -hmm. I believe them. Because I've driven down the road before and smelled it coming from someone's car thinking, what in the world? Um, but And I also want to be clear, we're talking about personal use marijuana. When we yeah. talk about legalizing and decriminalizing, we're not talking about distribution. So everything that we're talking about today does, would not mm -hmm. apply to people who are actually selling it and distributing it. Mm -hmm. um, but there's a huge disparity um, with sentencing. I see it in court. Um, I've had um, a, an attorney go before me, simple possession of marijuana. That defendant standing next to him is a young white male. That person pleads guilty and gets a $50 fine. I go up before the bench. My client next to me is a young black male. He pleads guilty and gets a suspended jail sentence of 10 days. Mm. And then they look, turn to me and say, well, I don't understand. Why did I get a suspended sentence? And he just went, walked away with the fine. Mm -hmm. And I can't explain it either to them. And what happens to them when they are, when they are um, do receive a sentence? How does that affect them down the line? Well, generally speaking, if you get a suspended jail sentence, there's some good behavior that comes with that. And it might be up to a year that they can get into no trouble at all. That would all include something as simple as a speeding ticket. So if they are found. Wow. Yeah. Really? So if they're found in violation of speeding, it is very likely that they could go back and have to serve the 10 days that was suspended versus a fine. Well, you don't have that kind of hanging over your head. Mm -hmm. It just kind of keeps them in tow for much longer um, for essentially having a harsher penalty for breaking a smaller rule down the road that many of us would get a speeding ticket prepaid and keep on, and keep keep on, on going. So, Bob, why, would, why then would dec decriminalization help the black community? Well, <clears throat> one, it would help the black community economically and socially. When we think about the disparity in the arrests and that blacks are disproportionately arrested at a higher rate. It's a social justice issue. Mm -hmm. So for us to be able to decriminalize, and I like the fact that the Commonwealth attorney made the distinction between decriminalization and legalization because they have both, both have separate impacts in the community, but for people in the community and to put a human face on it means that there's a significant impact socially and economically, like being able to get jobs. If you are a young black man, you already face with certain stigmas in the job market, in workforce development, so to speak. So it would create opportunities for more job opportunities as well as uh, social well-being. Mm -hmm. So, yep. Greg, where are we in turn? Uh, so, uh, let me back up. Medical marijuana is legal. <laughs> Use of medical marijuana is yes. legal in Virginia. Where are we on the decriminalization scale? And I'm coming to you soon, Joe. I think that uh, the more we talk about this issue, the more people are going to agree that either decriminalization or legalization is the direction that Virginia should be going in. I think that we are late in the game. Mm -hmm. um, so many other states have decriminalized it or legalized it, and they're reaping large profits from doing so. But I agree that the social justice issue is the more pressing issue. The way minorities are treated and dealt with uh, in the court system, 
Uh, mm-hmm. It goes on your record. It can affect all kinds of benefits, social benefits, like where you can live in public housing or not. It can affect your financial aid if you get a financial aid package and then you're convicted. It can affect your ability to seek more lucrative employment because when they do a background check, uh, the if fact, it pops up, if it pops up, you might not get that job. So it has a it has a wide ranging impact on a young person's life. Mm. Joe, what are, what's what are people saying on the ground? You're with President in AACP. You're out there in the community. What is the conversation in the black community about legalizing or decriminalizing marijuana? Um, I think the reception in the African American community is kind of like what Bob is saying as far as the social justice issue. Um, between churches and community leaders, I think they believe and we believe that it's a good thing, but we also recognize that it's not being done to benefit African Americans. Uh, and, and that's a deeper conversation that probably needs to be had. Mm-hmm. Uh, decriminalization of marijuana is moving so far now. Uh, Councilman Paul Riddick in Norfolk came up with a great concept a few years ago to push it out there, and it really didn't move the needle until Senator Tommy Norman said something about it because a different sector or a different group of culture finds that this industry is in- interesting now and the me- the needle's starting to move mm-hmm. in-, in Virginia. So I believe that, oh, I don't just say I believe, I've spoken with many um, African Americans. We recognize that we do support decriminalization of marijuana and probably some even preachers support uh, the legalization, but it's not solely done in Virginia to benefit African Americans. It's an industry, as a our Commonwealth attorneys already said that it's lucrative and people are recognizing that it's lucrative. And now it's kind of like the decriminalization, almost like, you know, the conversation about opiates. Mm-hmm. It's not a criminal act into a health, a health issue. So uh, we're, we're, conge- we're, we're paying attention to what's going on mm-hmm. uh, when we want what's best for the community. One of the issues is that also if you have a record um, uh, for using marijuana, you cannot participate on the economic side mm-hmm. of the industry. Is that correct? No. Why, that, you want to address that's, that? That's absolutely correct. And I, I think um, it goes back to what was just being said. Um, you know, I have found or I'm hearing that it's more of the um, white males that are pushing to have their records expunged um, or for legalizing it because they want to get in on the business too. Um, and, I find that interesting given the fact that it's mainly African-Americans that are being arrested for it. I mean, our percentage of convictions, convictions is way higher than um, the the other races. However, it's it's the white male that are pushing to get that change because they know they can't get in the business um, with the misdemeanor possession of marijuana mm-hmm. charge that they might have gotten in college or high school. Or So we have all of these um, African-Americans who are arrested, who have records, who can't participate in this. One percent, Bob, is what I understand approximately of African-Americans involved in the growing distribution end of it, the business end of industry wide. And they're talking about five, uh, 43 billion. Is that what I read um, this uh, in terms of? Yes. Forty three billion dollars within a decade. This, it's a huge industry. It's a lot of money. It's a lot of money. And it's also a challenge for most African-Americans, particularly investors and business people, because we're often undercapitalized. We we don't have the technical support. One of the reasons that we started Genesis Cannabis uh, Consulting is to work with those individuals and groups who had a desire to come into the business and have a squeaky clean record. They just mm-hmm. simply wanted to be in the game. They wanted to look to be a part of the entrepreneurial uh, process in making money. But oftentimes the challenges are such that if you don't have the funding as was required in Maryland, what we call pay to play, you don't get through the door. So uh, that's explain a little bit for the audience. What what is the process? I mean, you, I know you have to get licenses and and so forth. So what kind of money are we talking about? We're talking about. I'll use Virginia as the best example. Uh, Virginia, through the Board of Pharmacy, offered uh, an opportunity to establish five pharmaceutical processors. 
which required for an app- medical marijuana for medical marijuana, which required an application process. The application process required a fee of ten thousand dollars just for a conditional license. Once you are, once you would be accepted, which in this case five have already been accepted as of September twenty six, mm-hmm. then there is the sixty thousand dollar permit fee. So that's a pretty heavy lift for individuals that may not have that kind of capital and that kind of technical expertise available. Uh, not refundable. My, my, my non refundable. The ten thousand dollar application right. fee. Right. It's non refundable. So if right. you don't get it, you just out ten thousand dollars. Right. Right. In addition to that, Virginia created what's known as a vertically integrated process, which means you have to be able to grow, cultivate, dispense, and distribute all under one roof. That requires roughly a, a, a small operation minimum would be probably a million bucks just to ramp up. Mm. So there's inequity in, in, in the process itself, but there's also challenges in terms of access as it relates to diversity. Mm-hmm. So those are things that can really only be changed through policy and through regulation. Four four zero two six six five or one eight hundred nine four zero two two four zero are the numbers to call to join our conversation. What do you think? Should we decriminalize marijuana? Is this a good thing for the black community? Give us a call four four zero two six six five or one eight hundred nine four zero two two four zero. So people are watching states like Colorado and and uh, and others to see where we're going. But even there, um, Bob, I think you and I were talking about the fact that there still aren't a lot of African-Americans who've been able to get in, particularly on the growing and distribution side. That is absolutely correct. Uh, Even in California, which has been uh, instituting and implementing policies and regulations uh, aggressively since 1996, uh, it is Un, not unusual to walk into a public hearing or walk into a meeting and there are absolutely no African Americans. However, uh, California, through Proposition 64, created opportunities in allowing African Americans and black and brown people basically mm-hmm. to get to the table by creating new guidelines. And these guidelines was a result of the narrative that California created years prior that caused people to get beyond that reefer madness mindset. So now in 2018, as we go in, well, as you know, January 1, 2018, uh, California is legal recreationally. Mm -hmm. So as a result of that, there's a totally different mindset and there's a progressiveness and a proactiveness that invites all people to the table from a municipal, from a government standpoint to a private standpoint. 440-2665 or 1-800-940-2240 are the numbers to call to join our conversation. You spoke about reefer madness, uh, Bob, and I want to play a clip from, uh, I'm trying to find this gentleman's full name. Uh, He is a... uh, Senator Alford from Kansas, and he talks about why the state of Kansas should not legalize marijuana. And it's particularly because of something that he says happens with African-Americans. Let's play the clip. One of the reasons why I hate to say it, it's the African-Americans, they, they, they were basically users and they were and they uh, basically responded the worst to all those drugs is because their uh, character make them, their, their genetics and that. Joe, it's because of our genetics that we our can't smoke can marijuana. <laughs> <laughs> we can't smoke marijuana. But, but that mindset, 
you know, how does that play into this continued um, lack of opportunity for an industry that clearly a lot of people are going to make a lot of money, their jobs, their opportunities there, but we're being excluded? Um, it's, it's funny that you played that because we were talking earlier, um, me and Wanda Cooper. I don't know what you, you can not say what year it is mm-hmm. and you won't know that it's 2018. Um, I kind of find it funny that he's coming out in 2018 saying it's the genetic makeup uh, when marijuana has been in the African-American community for over 50 years. Um, Mm -hmm. And if we're going to talk about how people react differently to character, um, let's use another drug, heroin, that's also been in the African-American community for 50 years, isn't having the same reaction in certain communities that it is today. Uh, So I think that comments like that are not only going to impact Kansas, but impact Virginia uh, because I believe the African American community are already pessimistic of, we understand, we understand that decriminalization needs to be happening, Mm -hmm. but um, under what course and and what are the real benefits for African Americans? If it's, uh, if it's just for the fact of the matter that you decriminalize it and attorney Cooper can go in there and protect her client better or Greg Underwood could use his resources better. That's great. That's a good first step. But what are other communities using decriminalization for? Mm-hmm. Joe, if, let's be clear too. Um, it's all races are using it equally. Yes, yes, yes. 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 Definitely. So Definitely. you know, Definitely. whites and African Americans are using it at the same rate. They're just not being penalized, penalized. for it Penalty. at the same rate. Totally Absolutely. Different. Greg, I want to get your response to this. So Michelle Alexander, the author of the New Jim Crow, um, wrote. Uh, quote, after 40 years of impoverished black men getting prison time for selling weed, white men are planning to get rich doing the same thing. I uh, I tend to agree with the quote. Uh, it's unfortunate, but that's America and that's this country. And the sad part about it is black people, black men are still being penalized at a disproportionate rate, even in this day and age. So you don't have to go back 40 years and see how we were treated. We're being treated that way even today. Mm -hmm. That's why I strongly oppose uh, the continued criminalization of marijuana. It's my belief that the impact that it has on the black community would be equivalent to criminalizing poverty, the fact that you're poor. Hmm. See, a lot of the... That's a good one. A lot of the... uh, consequences of going to court, having to pay court costs, having to pay fines and costs, uh, getting a getting a, uh, uh, a requirement that you be on probation or have to report. Losing uh, your license. Losing your license. And you can't all drive to get you, to You work. can't drive, all of the consequences. And then you have a collection agency that's hounding your back because you need to pay your fines and costs. And uh, it just, you can't even drive to get to work. So it's unfortunate. Mm. 440-2665 or 1-800-940-2240. Jerome, <coughs> Jerome joins us from Smithfield. Hi, Jerome. You're in the air. Um, good afternoon. Good afternoon. I was, I was good at um, calling in reference to the decriminalization subject. Uh-huh. I was just telling um, the woman to answer the phone. That, you know, a lot of people are going to be the cause of their own doing because sometimes if you're at the traffic light or just right down the road, sometimes you can smell marijuana drifting to your car because of the car before you. Somebody is up there smoking it. But at the same time, there are a lot of companies that, you know, have zero tolerance for drugs or anything in the system when it comes to urinalysis tests. And right now, the way it is, a lot of people think they can go to certain states just because, you know, some states are legalizing it. You can go there if you're on a trip for your job or whatever and you can smoke like you want. But if you get hurt on a job and you get you know, taken for a urine test, that's pretty much it for you right there. I mean, they have the um, the resources such as drug rehab programs or anything, but you just don't want to be caught up in, you know, the secondhand smoke of it because you might not be a smoker, but at the same time you're around somebody. And a lot of people are really going to abuse it, that when they go to work and something does happen and they've been out smoking weed on the weekend with their friends, it's going to really take them down to another level, but a lot of companies are not going to really be accepting of that. Okay, Jerome, thanks so much for the call. Let's get a reaction from uh, from our panel. Joe, what are you thinking? Um, I, I, I tend to agree with them. I think it's a gray line. Um, I was talking to Mr. Stevens earlier. I'm going for work. I'm going to uh, California later next month. Mm-hmm. And I went, like, Barbara, I went to California like two years ago, and I was in L.A., and I got out at the hotel, the W., 
And when I got out, the workers were outside smoking marijuana. And as Juana said, how it carries, I was at least 50 yards away. Now, this boy from Virginia is in California for work. (laughs) And they outside. They're not hiding in the car. They're out in public, 12 o'clock, smoking marijuana. But uh, it's that gray line, you know, because I travel back and forth for D.C. Just because it's recreational used in D.C., like like Jerome's pointed out, that doesn't make it, especially in government work, that doesn't mean that you could drive to D.C. for the weekend get your edibles or whatever however you partake and be able to come <laughs> be back able to come work. back and go it's to work on Monday morning yeah I just don't and I I think we're years away from that in Virginia um, mm. as far as the allowance because until certain people can make their money or profit thereby they're not going to allow you to go across the border or a line and, and, and to Joe's point uh, you know as of January weed is currently legal in nine states and and, and Washington, D.C. And so the laws still exist in these states that bar public consumption or ban marijuana sales or what have you uh, for people, particularly people under 21. So, but Virginia is not one of those states. Right. So we have to be vigilant because in terms of arrest, that even though Virginia is not one of those states, uh, the arrest in the states where it's legal is just as uh, as great as it is in states that's not illegal. Mm-hmm. So once again, there's a disparity, disparity, you know, because once again, the rate of use is still the same, but black people are more likely to be arrested. If you're just joining us, we're talking about marijuana and the African-American community with Commonwealth's attorney Greg Underwood, attorney Wanda Cooper, president of the Norfolk branch of the NAACP, Joe Dillard, and Bob Stevens with Genesis Cannabis Consulting. I'm Barbara Ham Lee, and you're listening to Another View. One of the things that I was reading um, in, in about D.C., for example, it's legal, but you have to smoke in your house. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so you can't be outside. So people who live in public housing or apartment buildings, for example, where smoking is not allowed, that's not yet another barrier. Is it, Greg? I would tend to agree. Uh, however, a lot of it depends on the people enforcing the law. Mm-hmm. Because you can walk down the street where it's legal, and if you're black... Uh, it might be illegal to smoke publicly. You might get stopped if you white. You might not get stopped. So a lot of it depends upon the enforcement. But here in Norfolk, I think that that we have far more greater crimes to deal with than marijuana laws. I think that the city council can be proactive in the area of giving the police department some guidance on making the, I guess, making the uh, prosecution of simple possession of marijuana a low-level priority. For example, my office, we don't prosecute simple possession of marijuana. Mm -hmm. The police department does it on their own. Think about the resources that are being used. We get involved in a simple possession of marijuana case if it's accompanying another felony or if or yeah. if it's on appeal. But if but it's just straight simple possession. We don't, we don't do it. Other jurisdictions do it, but we got other we got other crimes in Norfolk we wanna deal with other than the simple possession of marijuana. Plus we don't have the resources to prosecute those cases. Mm-hmm. I think personally that it's a waste of resources to prosecute those cases when you can be prosecuting robbery cases, murder cases, rape cases, and harder drug cases like heroin, opioids, and so forth. 440-2665 or 1-800-940-2240. Jackie joins us from Virginia Beach. Hi, Jackie. You're on the air. Hi. Hi. Um, I have two, two things that I wanted to say. The first one is that um, I have a small business where I... Um, supply medical grade uh, edibles for people that are um, ill, cancer, uh, pretty much any illness that I think is um, that cannabis would be helpful for. Um, And so I've been following the legalization of it in Virginia, um, particularly the CBD uh, oil being becoming legal, certain levels of it being legal now in the state of Virginia. Um, I guess you know, it, it was, 
my the first thing is that my um, I've had some people, including my husband, say, "Aren't you worried about being caught?" Um, and um, I I have to say that because I am a white female with no criminal record, I sort of chalk it up to you know I'll probably get a slap on the wrist at most. So, wow. Um, I I understand exactly what you're saying, and I fully support. I mean, and I agree with everything that you're saying. Um, the other question, the other thing that I have an issue with is, you know, I followed very closely the legalization of it, and I knew exactly what you just lined up. And when you said the license was ten thousand dollar non refundable fee, um, you know, I knew all that stuff, and I, I was, it was really upsetting to me. But, but I, is that how it is in all the other states as well? Do they make it so that it is really not possible for the small business person to be involved in this business? Let me get an answer from our panel. Thank you so much for your honesty, Jackie. And thanks for calling. Jackie says, you know what? I'm a white female. Probably I'll get a slap on the wrist. But to answer her question about whether or not each of the states would be have a $10,000 fine or, or higher. No, actually, different states, uh, Jackie, have used different models. For example, uh, California will allow a license to be issued for simply being able to grow. Uh, it will allow a license to be issued for security, for uh, cultivation. So what they've done is broken, they've broken it down to a level where it's affordable to regular people that may just want to do one or two uh, areas of, uh, of the operation. So uh, Virginia is one of three states, if I recall, that used a vertically integrated process, uh, which creates a significant uh, uh, capital burden on anybody that wants to come into the business. Mm -hmm. So uh, hopefully that answers your question. Joe, what, where are we in terms of legislation? I guess to you and Greg on this one. Um, is there new legislation coming up for 2019? Are people talking about this in terms of moving more towards decriminalization? Or is it just kind of I, uh, <laughs> stuck I, again? <laughs> there's There's been legislation almost every year for the last five or six years. Mm -hmm. But uh, nothing ever gets passed. But more recently, there was a bill that was passed that basically made first offense possession of marijuana where uh, basically you're charged as a first offender. Your license wouldn't automatically be suspended. And first offense status means that it doesn't result in a conviction. But anytime it does result in a conviction, your license is going to be suspended. So... I believe that going forward, the more we talk about this issue, uh, more people are going to come on board. I recall a couple of years ago, my pastor asked me, Pastor Guns at Second Calvary, mm -hmm. asked me uh, my position on legalization of marijuana. And I told him my position. My position was the same as his. We as both agreed. Mm -hmm. And then I told him about the bill process, how you need to get a legislator to to uh, carry a bill. And so I said, he asked me, well, can you talk to someone? And I talked to someone, and the black legislator happened to tell me it would be political suicide for him to try to carry such a bill. And then when Tommy Norman got on board, because it's affecting his white colleagues or the students that he, uh, he represent at William & Mary, then it became a popular conversation because he saw the impact that it was having on his clientele, but that's the same impact it's been having on African Americans for years. Mm -hmm. And so he's the leader uh, in the General Assembly. He gets on board with it, and now it's a popular subject to talk about because it's affecting white people just as much as it's affecting black mm -hmm. people, although the number of white persons been affected is a lot less than the number of uh, African Americans been affected. Mm -hmm. So I believe that uh, the time is coming and I believe it's just a matter of time. I, I, I have so, to agree with them on that mm -hmm. um, because I, I can come from it from like a lobbyist standpoint mm -hmm. um, and I'm not going to say any names because I can't afford attorney Cooper beside me to represent <laughs> me. Um, but one thing that I learned in the, the application that Bob was speaking of of the five districts, so Hampton Rose was one 
of those five districts. Mm -hmm. Only one application was going to be chosen. Um, and I was contacted from a lobbyist standpoint, from lobbyists, actual lobbyists, to support a specific company. That company wow. contacted me, gave me presentations, called me, all this courting to support their application. So mm -hmm. I know Jackie called, and she's, I'm not going to, she's, her being her self-doctor, I'm not saying that. <laughs> but what I'm saying is, from that point, it's becoming actively lobbied for. Mm -hmm. And so those mm -hmm. localities, I read in the paper right after that, that uh, some people locally were upset. Because it's, it's not they, just the application process. It's lobbying behind it. Because just mm -hmm. like what Greg said, when Tommy Norman gets behind something as the Senate Majority Leader in Virginia Senate, mm -hmm. that's when the lobbying goes in. And um, mm -hmm. it's, it's some active lobbyists behind a lot of these corporations that were re awarded those contracts. So it's not just going into DMV and turning in your Absolutely. application. So, so, yeah. then how do we, yeah. so then how do we take... I, okay, I get it. Whoever it is that brings it to the forefront, the conversation is there. So now how do we back that up to swing it so that it does positively affect the black community? Well, you're doing it right here. Yeah. Uh, this is a just a uh, magnificent uh, platform, if you will, to have this narrative which leads to a dialogue which obviously will lead to debate. And also we're putting a human face on this issue because to put a human face on it means that we're asking the question of whether your loved one, a family member, or a friend deserves to be arrested, jailed, and face a lifetime of punishment and discrimination. So mm -hmm. as we look to a legislative perspective, we can also think about what Virginia could do in terms of where we go from here. And where we go from here could be adopting social equity programs as similar to what they've done in both Denver and both in Colorado and California, which provides for zero interest loans, fee waivers, you know, creating opportunity and in industry. So actually in, carving a way so that they right. can be more equity. But, but that in terms has of to the, happen from a legislative perspective. And I think we'll all agree yeah. that Tommy Norman's legislation was probably well intended for his students at William and Mary, but it did not go far enough. Okay. I mean, it didn't, just didn't, didn't work. Our I, phone lines are lit up. Go ahead, Greg, and I then I'm gonna take a call. there has to be a legislative solution, uh, particularly when it comes to our expungement laws. Mm -hmm. A lot of people think that you can hire an attorney and you can get a conviction expunged it doesn't work that way. A conviction mm -hmm. is a conviction. If you go to court and you are acquitted, that's not a conviction. You can get your record expunged. But once you have a marijuana conviction, that conviction is with you till the day you die. So you cannot get that expunged once? No, expungement, um, and I, I know we have the caller, and it, okay. you know, expungement is allowed for charges where you were found not guilty if the Commonwealth decide to null process or not go forward or dismissal. Those are the only times that you qualify. So, for example, Greg talked mm. about first offender status, whereby the law affords you an opportunity to have a one shot deal is what I call it, where you have a drug charge. You agree to do a substance abuse program, pay your pay your court costs and the charge is dismissed. However, you cannot have a first offender not guilty. I'll say it like that. Or a first offender dismissal expunged. So an employer might look at your criminal history and an employer may not really know how to read it because they'll look at it and they'll see, they'll see you were charged with possession of marijuana. They don't keep reading to see whether or whether not it was not dismissed. Came... Oh. You know, and so um, and you can't have that removed. Unlike if you were charged with possession of marijuana, we went to trial and you were found not guilty. You can have that whole thing removed to show that you were never even arrested. So we have the social justice side of it. But we also, from a legislative standpoint, we've got to find a way to be able to either get it off people's record or make some sort of waiver. Because even mm -hmm. if we get all this done, all the people in the past that have all these convictions still won't benefit from it. I would imagine this is not a very popular topic among legislators oh, to, no. to, to step out there and be first. Well, well Barbara, it, <laughs> no, it, it really, it, it, and you're absolutely correct. Uh, and that's why the lobbying activity is as it is, because for a legislator to take this on, that means that they must be willing to put something at stake. Mm -hmm. And when you're willing to put something at stake, there's high risk. But yeah. this is a, 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 an, an industry that is moving quickly. And unless 
Virginia and the rest of the country gets on board. And and the way that could happen is also lobbying federal legislators to take marijuana off the controlled substance list because allowing when the fed when the feds uh take it takes it off the list that means that the states are then given a l- more leeway to do what they need to and do and i want to talk about the whole federal thing first but let's yeah. take a couple of calls uh benjamin joins us from hampton hi benjamin you're on the air hey how are you doing okay. i just wanted to make a comment uh, about the beginnings of marijuana criminalization in this country and the comment that i heard from somebody from kansas about there being some kind of genetic predisposition is what made me think of it uh, there's a Kansas no marijuana tax stamp law from the 1800s, and mm-hmm. it was put on the books to stop Central Americans, Mexicans from taking ranch hand jobs from people. And so they were using it as sort of a religious persecution of people, religion in the sense that it was their you know customs, beliefs, and practices to do this. Mm-hmm. And then it moved on to jazz era, using it as persecution against blacks. And then it moved into the 60s where Nixon started the war on drugs because he wanted to lock up protesters for longer than just a couple of days. He wanted to be able to put them behind bars for months at a time to stop them from going back on the streets and having a sign in their hands. And if we could look at it from the context that this has always been about religious persecution and creating a minority to be persecuted, then we can really begin changing this. Okay. Uh, and to speak to the conservative black community, I would also suggest looking at uh, Bible verse in Romans, where it says not to make yourselves slaves to anything. And marijuana is one of those drugs where it's not making you a slave. It's letting you maintain your, your will and your freedom and your cognizant ability to continue to function. And if you compare that to a lot of other drugs, like the opium that we're having a problem with in our country... The truth would help people not fall into the traps of other drugs by continuing to spread the lies that the Nixon administration started. We're not really keeping our children believing us. Once they realize that marijuana is not the most dangerous thing on the planet, like the Reagan administration was telling us, they start asking themselves, well, maybe they're lying about the other drugs. Yeah. Let me let me cut you off here just so, just because we have a lot of calls and I want to give our panel a chance to respond. Thanks for the call, Benjamin. I appreciate that. So you gave a lot of food for thought. Absolutely. <laughs> <You did>. Absolutely. <laughs> Definitely. Leland joins us from Virginia Beach. Hi, Leland. You're on the air. Yeah. Hi. Um, I have a friend who's nearly 75 and this person uh, had some serious uh, injuries and was on uh, tramadol, which is an opioid, for 11 years. At the end of the 11 years, uh, the state of Virginia and Richmond put out all these new rules and pulled back all these prescriptions. And this friend of mine was going through hell over this thing. So he had to, he went to pain management, went to four different pain management, and every one of them would not treat him because he had uh, marijuana in his urine. And uh, I think that's just disgraceful. So, okay. Um, I'm a little confused in terms of... So you're saying that he started using marijuana because he could not get the opioids? No. The person he'd been using marijuana to uh, help with the uh, pain. Right. That's what I'm saying. Because he could and not he get his pain. opioid to no, help with the was, pain, he, he was, was using marijuana instead. No, he, he was taking the marijuana for 11, I mean, uh, opioid for 11 years for pain. Mm-hmm. And then when they, they took it away from him, he was going, he didn't know what to do. So he, he, he smoked pot right. in order to help with the pain. And it's supposed to help you uh, with get okay. off opioids, and then they wouldn't uh, they wouldn't h- help him because there was a urine in his in, he was tested for urine, and he, uh, they wouldn't treat him. Okay, thank you so much for the call, Leland. We appreciate that, um, Barbara. I hear that a lot, especially okay. um, I've defended a lot of clients where they had it for personal use because they suffer from severe migraine headaches or whatever health condition they have. Mm-hmm. One, the marijuana is cheaper. Okay, if you don't have health insurance now. You can't afford what the doctor might be prescribing you, nor do they like the feeling that they get from some of the medication. Mm -hmm. And I've had many clients say, you know, I just I don't have all the side effects associated with it. I can live a 
somewhat normal life um, and mm-hmm. trying to communicate that to the court and the judge sometimes is effective depending on who that client is and sometimes, and sometimes it's not. not. Again, it comes down to so so really this whole thing about this bias inside the criminal justice system is a major issue in terms of all of this, is it not? Sure. It is sure. indeed. Yeah. Yeah. I mean from policing to how the drug is administered in the public domain. Yeah. Okay. William joins us from Williamsburg. Hi William, you're in the air. Good afternoon. Thank you for taking my call. Sure. Uh, while I believe it should be decriminalized and even legalized, I think in our current administration, uh, this will be something that Trump can use to, again when he decides to run for re-election to to fire up his base uh, to you know to uh, attack liberals as being for decriminalization and legalization, uh, and. Basically, use the you know use the attorney general and the DEA to crack down because there's a lot of money uh, being made that's not in federally insured banks, so that's confiscation of property, uh, throw a lot of people in jail, which is going to make him look good to his base. And I think this is something we really got to be careful to you know be careful as we move forward with this. And that's pretty much what I got to say. Uh, okay, thank you, William, for the call. I'm not quite sure. I got a little confused in terms of what William was saying. Did you I think, understand I think he was, what he was saying? What he was saying was liberals like myself want to decriminalize marijuana. Oh. And what my response would be to him is it's the right thing to do. It's not about being liberal. It's about justice. It's about justice for minorities. That's what it's about. Mm-hmm. Despite what Trump says, he's going to he's going to pander to his base regardless. And I just disagree. It's the right thing to do. And I'm with Greg. I don't think it's a party thing, per se, uh, because um, I I think marijuana has so many good benefits now. Um, You know, someone in your family has been touched by cancer or some other Mm -hmm. illness um, Mm -hmm. that this particular drug can help. And I don't think that goes across race or party lines at all. Um, When you've been touched by something like that, and I've sat with those people that tell me, you know, if I have to go to jail for 10 days, then I'm going to go. I'm because, going because I, I need this. In order I need to, this to live, to, be able to, to live. survive. Yeah. You have a good quality of life. So do you think how long do you think it will take for the federal government to make marijuana legal? Because if all the state, I mean, I guess if all 50 states go there, then call, eventually they'll, it'll have to be legal. Call me Wednesday. Call me Wednesday after this election. <laughs> <laughs> Where do you think we are in that process, though? There, there, there's uh, wow. Cory, Cory Booker is moving some aggressive legislation uh, on the Hill. Uh, in terms of a time frame, I think the only point of reference would be California and and Colorado and Maine and Washington State mm-hmm. and with the pace that they've moved which is pushing the federal process I would venture to say that it will happen uh, probably before the next presidential election Ooh. really yeah Wow. Yeah. That'll be faster because, than Virginia. Because huh? as of right now we have 31 <laughs> yes. we have 31 <laughs> states on board my goodness. It's going to be in, fat, federal. It's going to be faster than Virginia. Yeah. I know that. Yeah. Really? Yes. 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 Virginia yes. is deemed, I mean, we, we yeah. have old archaic laws yeah. still yeah, on you the You got to remember, we still operate yeah. under the Dillon rule and, and, and all of this archaic the Commonwealth. stuff. The Commonwealth. I mean, yeah. uh, there are legislators, federal legislators know that their jurisdictions and their constituents are losing significant amounts of money every day that that decriminalization, that legalization doesn't happen. As long as mm-hmm. prohibition is allowed to happen, everybody's losing money. Uh-huh. So there you go. We got three minutes left. Let me give each of you 30 seconds. Last thought, Greg. I think the, the city needs to take a position on the marijuana issue in the sense that city council can let the police department know that the prosecution of marijuana cases by the police department should be a low-level priority. Uh, and that's my take on it. I okay. think city city council has to take some action. Commonwealth's Attorney Greg Underwood, thank you so much for joining us today. Was. Wanda? I think, um, one, our young people need to be careful out there. 
Um, you know, it's harder for you to be charged with something if you're tag cars licensed and registered properly and you're in the house when you're supposed to be and doing what you're supposed to do Mm -hmm. and um you know i I ask people especially defendants to remember that the person that's deciding your fate generally cannot relate to you um and so just keep that in mind they may not have had the experiences that you had and my job as defense counsel Mm -hmm. is to let somehow make the court relate and understand why you do what you do that mm-hmm. if you do smoke marijuana, that doesn't mean you're crazy, you're not smart, that you don't have a good brain, et cetera. Um, and so my hope is that we'll also get some diversity on the bench so that judges will be able to relate more to the defendants that come before them in court. Fantastic. Wanda Cooper, attorney, thank you so much thank for you. joining us. Joe, um, your thoughts? I think we're positioned, and I say we're as in the city of Norfolk, we are one of the greatest Commonwealth attorneys, and I just don't say that based on him saying where he stands on this issue. Yeah. Uh, Paul Riddick, uh, Cindy Cutler, people leading the way. It's not just for Norfolk. It's going to be Norfolk leading the way for the Commonwealth of Virginia. Uh, I think people need to continue to have these conversations that we're having here, mm-hmm. Barbara, uh, but include us not only just in the disparities of the criminalization of it, but the economics. Um, I know, I think it was Benjamin who called in and said the conservatives. I don't think pastors are conservative mm-hmm. based on the Bible. I think they're pessimistic and conservative based on the impacts of the community after the fact that it's decriminalized. Gotcha. Are you going to use us to make more money? Or are you going to help us along the way? And I think that's where the African-Americans come in with the pessimistic and being concerned in a conservative manner. Okay. Joe Dillard, president of the Norfolk NAACP. And Bob, you have the last words. Well, thank you. Uh, <laughs> Barbara, just once again, thanks to you and the staff here at WHR uh, uh, to, for, for doing this, for providing a platform for us to have this kind of dialogue in the public domain. And I think going forward that while we can applaud Virginia for taking steps to create this legally and properly regulated path for its citizens to access the CBD and the oils, it has done little to protect its citizens from the criminal aspect. And I think that needs to be an imperative in this community. Okay, and that's Bob Stevens with Genesis Cannabis Consulting. I love that title. Absolutely. (laughs) And thank you all so much for joining me today. We got a couple more minutes then that we can chat. (laughs) So um, is anyone lobbying any um, of the uh, uh, legislators at this point, in other words, Joe, for, for example, the NAACP, are you guys going to any legislator to say, let's keep moving this thing forward? So the state conference has adopted, legisl- well, not adopted legislation, but there have been resolutions put forth to decriminalize marijuana. Uh, so there is active lobbying on your locals and state level right right. okay thank you again so much and special thanks to the panelists who've given us much food for thought if you'd like to hear this show again or share it with a friend visit our website anotherviewradio.org and download the podcast next week the another view roundtable with analysis and insight following next week's elections our theme music was composed and performed by jay sennett lisa godley is our show producer todd washburn is our audio engineer engineer and Janae Jackson answered our phones. I'm Barbara Ham Lee. The most important thing you can do over the next few days is study the candidates and then vote on Tuesday. Please make your voice heard, everybody. And thank you so much for listening to Another View. <laughs>